Hello and welcome from Bogota, Colombia to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those with some connection to Latin America. This episode is brought to you by LatemList.com. If you like this podcast, you'll enjoy LatemList's daily tech news reporting. Sign up for the mailing list to get weekly email updates. My guest today is Ariel Arieta, co-founder and managing partner of NXTP, an Argentine Latin American venture capital firm and accelerator. Ariel always knew he wanted to be in tech and started playing with computers and programming all the way back in 1995. He had a front row seat to the first tech boom, starting multiple companies, some of which failed and some of which did really well and were later required. After taking 10K in angel investment from a friend and returning him $2 million to that same friend, he started angel investing himself and then tried to figure out how he could be more scalable. And that's where NXDP was born. They're now one of the most active, if not the most active, early stage firm in Latin America and just had their first unicorn, Auth0, come out of their portfolio. We talk about the Latin American tech ecosystem, advice for founders, and Ariel's lessons learned from his time both as an entrepreneur and now as an investor. I hope you enjoy my conversation with NXTP's Ariel Arieta. Hey, Ariel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Thank you for having me. No, thanks for taking the time. So where are you in the world today? I'm in Buenos Aires right now in the next TP Ventures office in Palermo, close to um, what the health of the Buenos Aires ecosystem is. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about NXTP. Uh, NXTP is a, it's a seed fund. We start in 2011. We with this first fund, we have a, we have a, a fund with an acceleration process. Traditionally, we, we want to be the, like a, the white combinator of Latin America. That was the mission when we start. And with this uh, model, uh, we review 5,000 companies. We accelerate 400 of these companies. We made direct investment in 200 of these companies. Uh, follow ones on 75 of these and the fund one we sold 18 companies we have <clears throat> uh, 30 something companies that are right off uh, we have another 30 something companies that we consider walking dead companies that are not dying but they will we have uh, 90 companies that are model growth high growth um, i think maybe below our initial expectation but we have 41 companies that we consider high impact. For us, high impact means that they have a potential value of $100 million plus. Um, four of these companies are potential unicorns. And one of them is uh, a, a few weeks ago, they achieved the goal to be our first unicorn in the, in the portfolio. It's an out zero. Congratulations. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about how the ecosystem has evolved from 2011 when you first started all the way till today. Uh, the ecosystem was completely different. We have a more mature uh, market right now. Um, to give you some numbers from 2011 to 2016, the average investment each year was between 300 to $500 million total market. From 2016 to 2018, this number grew up to 500 to 1.1 billion. That is more than 100% growth. And last year, this number grew to 2 billion, according to the LAPCA numbers. And our projection is that for this year, we will have between 4 to $5 billion investment if this continues the, the same trend. And with this number, at the beginning of the year, it sounds like a ridiculous number. And then um, the, the question was, where they scamming this money, um, probably foreign money. Uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, SoftBank announced a vision fund for Latin America with a $5 billion investment. And they made the first investment in, in Rapid from 1 billion. And this number can have a, a, a solid solid base to think that they, we can achieve this for $5 billion investment this year. And this is representing a, a momentum that we have a, in, in Latin America. We, we follow one, one model from Carlota Perez, which is 
she described the evolution of um, the cycles of the innovation and the different uh, industrial revolutions. And she explained that every uh, disruption uh, starts in, in, a, in a core. And for this uh, knowledge revolution, this core will be Silicon Valley. And then they grow to the, the semi periphery and then the periphery. The semi periphery is China and Europe. And we are the periphery in, in Latin America. And that is explain how this uh, model of the disruption is starting there. And they are moving. And right now, it's, it's starting to have this uh, special momentum of and the evolution of the ecosystem. And what we are living right now is this uh, this model when we start in a, in a different ecosystem and, and, and we are seeing how the, the whole ecosystem is changing with the appetite from the investors, new investors coming, uh, the mentors and people from other industries wants to, to have a portion of this uh, innovation. And the entrepreneurs that are more mature and more sophisticated, they can explain what the PC industry is, is trying to, to achieve. And, and, and it's, a, it's a more uh, mature ecosystem right now. Yeah, we like to talk about, say, the last year or so being Latin America's inflection point, where I mean, I think you're right that it's going to be four to five billion this year. From our kind of back of the envelope numbers, we think it's already around two. 2.2 to 2.3 billion already in 2019. And if it does hit that four or 5 billion, it's gonna be more money this year than all the way from 2010 till today. Yeah, It's incredible the amount of, of money that's 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 coming in. Yeah. And the quality of entrepreneurs is also going up, yeah. at least from what I've seen. But if you are comparing this summer with the with with the states or, or, or other markets, then last year in the states are almost one million, one billion, $100 billion investment, investment in this, in this uh, venture capital market right now is uh, in terms of GDP, we we still have a couple of drops in the ocean with these uh, four or five billions. We have uh, plenty of room to to grow. Oh, I agree. I mean, it's it's still one of the most, if not the most, underinvested region in the world for tech. I mean, if you just compare, we're talking about this being the best year ever for Latin America tech, and maybe four billion. This will be the first year that it surpasses the one round that the Saudi Arabian fund put into Uber, which was, I think, 3.6 billion, yeah. just one investment. Yeah. So we're talking, it's still tiny for the region and for the amount of money that uh, is in the region, the amount of people that it can impact. Yeah. So it's you know the, the, the famous Jeff Bezos thing of this is still day one. <laughs> uh, I think we're still day one in Latin America. Completely agree. And we are seeing this uh, as a potential opportunity also for foreign investors and for uh, local ones that they want to participate in uh, this innovation and this uh, ecosystem. That that will be what we create opportunity for for many new yep. generations. One of the interesting things that I think we talked about last time we met in person was about how a lot of the big rounds were coming from abroad, and that it is sort of a shame that many of the local uh, either family offices or institutions. Are generally missing missing the boat. Most of this upside is going to people outside of the region. Yeah. Um, and it will be interesting to see how we can kind of push more local people to get more involved in in the industry that's booming in their own backyard. Yeah. Uh, and we need to develop the the local venture capital ecosystem. I think that there is uh, some people that are institution uh, like uh, Monashis or Casex that they are. Uh, from the day one, trying to create this uh, this uh, this industry, but uh, if you compare the evolution of that of VC in Latin America, and you compare wh where there are raising capital from what is happening in the States or in Europe, you the the missing part here is the lack of institutional investors. There is no pension funds in Latin America investing in, in this type of assets. There is no a few insurance company is trying to do something um, but this um and these numbers in in the state represent 60 percent of the of, of the total funding of of abc um, we are losing the first uh, the most important investor mexico is trying to change this with the secades chile is trying to do um, a fund of funds in which the 
the pension fund from, from Chile can invest through these uh, corporate funds of funds, and then they will drive uh, this uh, capital in, in, in VC funds. But that's uh, the, the few intents to, to do that. One of my, just a comment on the, the Chilean piece, one of my fights with in the Chilean ecosystem is that uh, it's 100% necessary to get the pension funds involved. But doing it via the government, where a fund like us, which doesn't have government money, is excluded from the process, and also top other funds from around the region will be excluded because yeah. they don't have Corfo money. It just feels like it's yeah. not the right step, right? So figuring out how we can do it where there's enough regulation that you're not just getting pension money into fund managers that are just doing it for the management fee, but also making sure that uh, it's open for people that don't necessarily need the government subsidy. Yeah, uh, we, in our fund one, we, we raised almost 10 million from the for, for government, but in, the, in our second fund, we, we just raised the first 40, 40 millions in our second fund. We choose don't take money from, from Corfo for some uh, limitation that they are willing to, to invest capital in in companies based on in, in Chile and this type of restriction. So far, we choose don't have this type of restriction, but um, let's see how we finish our uh, our fundraising if we need to to do that. But so far, we choose don't take this this type of money. They are providing a lot of value because they create an ecosystem that 10 years ago didn't exist in Chile. But uh, I think that they, there is another way to do that properly. Yeah, I agree. They, they definitely provided an amazing amount of laying the groundwork between helping funds and Startup Chile yeah. and uh, grants to, to entrepreneurs. It's, it's clear they've done a great job. Um, my hope is that we can help kind of push to the next step where maybe you don't need as much government because the ecosystem is starting to work. Yeah. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. So I wanted to, before we go deeper into NXDP, which we will, I want to go into you a little bit. Okay. Um, where are you from originally? I'm born and raised in, in Argentina and came from a low middle class uh, family without access to uh, a great education or bilingual education or or a Ivy League type of education. I started in the public school here, became, um, at the age of 12, I realized that I want to do something related with uh, computers because I received as a gift my first computer. It was an Atari 800 XL. It's a small computer. And this uh, presently changed my life because I was um, very involved with the BBS and all the free internet networks of uh, computers. And when I started the internet connection here in Argentina, that was in 1995, I was the first one to, to jump in and to try to create a kind of value speed with uh, my friends, only to, to have access to, to be connected to, to the internet full time. And in 1999, everyone, I started to work in an ISP very at that time when it's coming 1999 uh, everyone wants to to invest in startups uh, internet startups because uh, at that time um, Patagon was in the front page of uh, all the newspapers because they raised 40 million dollars in in a, in a company an internet company and everyone wants to jump in this new economy uh, deals and at that time, I had a PowerPoint. With this PowerPoint, I raised $2 million in exchange of 99, 95% of my company. And with that, uh, I became an entrepreneur. That is something that is not happening anymore. And you don't raise $2 million just with a PowerPoint. And you don't give up uh, 95% in the, in the first round of your company. But that was the, the wild west from from here, and with that, I began to be an entrepreneur. I convinced my my investors to to sell speaks in the gold rush. That was the, the claim that I used to to convince them that they, they we have to create a company to sell services for the golden rush that uh, we are here having here with the 
with the new internet of the new economy. And when we raise the capital and start the company, we realized that the, the wrong approach for, for doing that, and we had to create portals. In 1999, we created our first portal called OK Compra. It was a shopping mall, like a shop, Yahoo Shopping. And with this portal, we we became in the front page of a magazine called Infor Information Technology. And thanks to this um, magazine, I met my wife. <laughs> and, and with this, um, the, that was uh, the the beginning of my family. But the business was a very bad business. Not that I met my wife. <laughs> I happily married yet. Uh, but uh, we had the wrong business model. We we collect money by transaction instead of having other other models. We have a problem. We and, and in that in that moment uh, there was a few internet users there was a uh, nobody wants to put their credit card online and no one wants to do it in, in the web version that we create for mobile at that time we, we was very early for for this process then, then we, we sold this company to uh, another retail company uh, with a bad uh, not not so good uh, deal and then we, we created another company called Becomex, and we sold this company to an American company. With that, it was a kind of a, a Alibaba version of for Latin America for foreign trade. And with that, uh, we collect two million dollars in this transaction. But at that time, we want to have equity instead of cash. And we negotiate hard with the with the buyer to have. A, and finally, we have we received six hundred k in in cash and the rest in equity. And that was in 1999. In the year 2000, this equity was zero. And in the year 2001, they came the Argentina crisis. We blow up the company. And we had to fire everyone and to declare bankruptcy. I went to work to a, a digital agency as an employee. In this, this digital agency, I made my co-founder for the next one was Damian Voltes. They have the same story than me. They, raised three million dollars for a company called coupones online in 1999 and he blew up the company in in 2001 uh, in the same crisis and with him we we decided to start a, a new company but we had this incredible track record to blow blow up one company each other and lose uh, five million five million dollars in, in in the two investment together and with this incredible track record it was very hard for us to raise capital at that moment we realized that we need only 20k to start a company and um, one friend of mine gave us 10k and we never found the second 10k long story short in 2003 we started this company called digital ventures with this company we sold this company in 2007 with offices in three countries from 2007 to 2009 we opened offices in 21 countries the plan was using this in, in 32 countries but in the year to 2008 they came the the new crisis and with this crisis they is coming a hiring freeze and we stopped to to open more offices with uh, fox but in the middle we incubate uh, six or seven companies in which only one works and we saw also this company was in search we it was a sem agency we sold also the, the company to to fox to news corporation um when I finished my agreement with with Fox in 2009, I left Fox. I didn't want to work in corporations. I want to spend more time with the startups. I want to replicate the story of my friend who invests 10,000 10k in in our company, and in two years, in four years, he converted this 10k in almost two million dollars. It was the return that he received. And with that in mind, I start to be an ancient investor. And then I realized that there is a big opportunity investing early, very early on in tech companies, but it's very hard to to scale this this business model because the companies need on top of the money they need connection, advising, and a lot of time. And when you are investing in seven eight companies, you will be hundred percent dedicated to to help these companies. And it's a business model that is very hard to scale. And with that in mind, we start to think in, in other models like uh, the YC model. Uh, and with that, uh, we start NXCP with this vision to scale 
these uh, investment opportunities to develop more relationship with an instructor that we can handle not only the investment side, the value supporting of this startup that we invest. So it's an amazing story. Uh, lots of different ups and downs. Yeah. I want to go back to what you some lessons that you've learned between the companies that didn't work and the companies that did. What what were some of your biggest takeaways or lessons learned that you had in the companies that did and didn't work? Yeah, the, the most obvious one is the timing is uh, <laughs> is very important because uh, all the models that we prove in, in the beginning of my career, uh, they proved to be uh, right in different times. And, and timing is very important. And uh, for in, from the investment side, the, the, the team uh, is obvious things, but the team is a very, it's the most important uh, factor that you have to consider when you are investing in, in early stage companies. Uh, then when you are, the company is growing, the team is less, less critical. Um, if you are investing in the private equity part of the business, probably you don't care too much about the, the team and you are thinking more on the size of the market or the uh, business model or the asset of the company of the investment. But with the VC mentality, team is the most important factor. And then of course, the size of the market or the execution capabilities of the, and the business model that, that they have. And what, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs when trying to pick the business to start? You started multiple different businesses and then you also have seen thousands of businesses that other entrepreneurs have started now in your career with NXTP. Yeah. What advice do you give entrepreneurs on how to pick an idea? Um, the most important thing is uh, if you are doing this for, for making money, probably there is other ways to, to make money easily than, than, than doing an, an, a startup. And the most important is try to understand what is the, the motivation of the entrepreneurs. If they are doing something that is relevant for them, is a, they are solving a, a problem, which is um, they have different meaning for the rest of the, the people. We like to invest in, in, in startups that, that are a little bit crazy. Uh, and we define this currency as a, what is why they have these obsessions to solve this particular problem. And when you find this type of entrepreneurs are the ones that are creating a lot of value because they, they will have the ups and downs of these uh, roller coasters and, and they are, don't give up when everything goes bad. The, we, we say that the, the the first years of a, a startup is the easy one, and the, five, the fifth year is also easy. And the problem is that the, the three, four years that are in the middle, because <laughs> when you are starting, everything is uh, it's adrenaline. You are thinking in new ways to solve a problem. You raise capital, but then the capital that you raise probably uh, is not enough. You have a lot of problems because you can you you couldn't prove that your business model works or the cost per acquisition was higher than you, you can expect. The growth that you, you have in your Excel, uh, you never achieve and you are running out of capital. And in that moment, you have to be very persistent in, in what you are trying to, to achieve. And if you are, your only motivation is about money, probably that will be the, the moment that when you drop the ball and you are not convinced to 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 have this this closing. Um, probably you will have also more opportunities if you are a good track record and you have a good education. Probably you will have a lot another opportunities to and your cost of opportunity will be much higher than try to iterate in the in the same business model or, or try to chase the same opportunity. But if you are persistent in this model and, and you find a way to, to solve this, this problem, which is a startup that tried to convert this opportunity in a company, the next four, five years uh, will be easier because you are trying to scale what uh, is really working. Um, but the problem is this uh, middle point in which all your ideas doesn't work and you, <laughs> you have to find new ideas to try new things to solve this problem. And the only way that you can do that is 
with the right motivation and, and a good team to provide more ways to to hack the, the, this problem. So going to the early days of NXTP, you, you wanted to find a scalable way to replicate kind of the angel investor model. What were your first steps to finding that team to get the NXTP off the ground? Yeah, we we found a, another a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs that are trying to, to, to do the same. And it, which is different from the team that we have right now in the fan two, which is more analytical or more um, consulting oriented. Uh, with the fun one, we 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 found that uh, for us the when we, we, we try to to do uh, the, the fundraising of of our fund, we we discovered that we have track record as a entrepreneurs, but not as a fund managers. And when we went to the typical family office or high net individuals asking for money, they they say that we don't have the track record to to manage their money. Um, and the way that we we solved this problem was uh, doing a kind of crowdfunding in which we asked twenty five k for a bunch of friends that that came in from from the entrepreneur world. And adding them also to a rooster of mentors. Um, hopefully, the, the the friends that accepted to this challenge was uh, Marco Galperin, the founder of Mercado Libre, Alec Oxenford, the founder of the Remate, and then OLX, and uh, right now Let Go. Uh, who I think that the only thing that they co invest these these two guys was in in our fund because they was. Uh, rivals in, in terms of uh, what they want to do with uh, the Romate and Mercado Libre. And then uh, Wences Casares, the uh, founder of uh, Patagon or Sapo right now, or he's in the board of PayPal, or uh, Marian Suarez Fatan and Pato Schutter, that there was uh, two founders that created a company called Three Melon. They sold this company to Playdom and then to Disney. Um, and, and, and another, uh, almost 100 um, entrepreneurs that did something relevant and they want to put 25k. With this 25k, we raised 2.5 million in terms in, in, in capital, which is not so much money. But with that, we proved that we can deploy capital, and with that, we convinced our first institutional investor that was the, the FOMIN, the Inter-American Development Bank, Susana Garcia Robles. Uh, it was a, the fund of funds more active for. In, in Latin America, and one of the the few that uh, put money on in part-time fund managers, and she takes the chance to invest in our fund, which we have a very different uh, model because we have these accelerator programs, and we invest uh, a few ma a few ticket a small ticket in in a, in a few startups, but in terms of the the, the typical fund who he she will invest, uh, he invests uh, between 20 to 30 companies. We want to have a, a portfolio of 300 companies. Uh, that was our plan from the day one. And with that in mind, she she was the, the one that put $5 million. With this $5 million, we we convinced the guys from Corfo to put another $10 million in, in the fund. And then in Adem, the Institute of Entrepreneur was the other one that put uh, $4 million. And, and then with some family offices, and um, finally uh, the IFC uh, jumped as a last in, in the fund. Um, the IFC is a World Bank who invests money also in, in the fund. Uh, and with that, we, we close our, our first fund with these institutions, uh, institutional investment, and some, um, and some family office and high net individuals. But at the beginning, we start doing this with, with this crowdfunding model. And crowdfunding was our world, but they, they was not popular in 2011 in, in Latin America. So if you could go back to when you were just starting the fund, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself, either about fundraising or just being a fund manager in general? Uh, I think uh, fundraising is one of the toughest part of the, the being a fund manager. Uh, one advice uh, that I want to, to I want to give me is 
that uh, you have to hire um, people that uh, just did uh, just have to make a fundraising uh, and to have this uh, investor relationship very very close because that will be the the ones that they they, they help you to do this uh, this next fund and that is a um, opportunity that we we have very good uh, investor but we we did by ourselves instead of having people that are working full life doing uh, fundraising and that's something that we need to to change in our structure um uh, in terms of investment um i think that the we need to be more focused on on the team that's a number one criteria but we lost a, a, a lot for a lot of opportunities investing money in entrepreneurs that are coming from the state for example that they they see the opportunity here in in latin america to do the whatever you want uh, copycat from other models and when they fail they go back to to their countries and they uh, give this change for the lack of resilience that you we, we we are seeing in other entrepreneurs and also the opportunity cost that they had to go back to uh, do a new startup or, or other thing and probably we will we will think again if we had to, to do this type of investment if you could recommend any books blogs podcasts documentaries any sort of information sources to entrepreneurs uh, what would they be I love to to use um, Audible as a platform, and I love I, I learn a lot of books. The one is it's very basic, but it's a good example right now. Is uh, the Secrets of Sunkill Road. Uh, I couldn't find the secret right now, but uh, the libro, the book is really good uh, writing, pretty basic for my preference but uh i think that the that's it's a new one uh, the other is a trillion dollar coach it's a very good one principle for from ray dalio others uh, stories like a uh, bad blood is a it's a nice one ai superpower is another, another good good book travel makers the story of uh, silicon valley broadtopia is a new one also regarding the gender, gender bias and factfulness is a really good one book also or in terms of negotiation never split the difference is another nice uh, book this is uh, the one that i i have in in my my list training right now and also i don't know the post blogs like uh the fred wilson is uh, always great to to read and other investors like uh, and recently they, they published Another a, a lot of very good content. If you are the the internet trends from May Merker, there are a, a, another source of uh, good data to analyze trends. That is a, an amazing resource. That year by year they they surprise you. What's next for you and for NXTP? I think that uh, create our billion dollar fund, <laughs> like <laughs> in any other uh, market. Sounds completely and probably right now, but we think that that will be on the, the opportunity for many of the funds in Latin America right now. If this trend is continuing, and probably we, what's today it sounds a, it's a great idea, probably that will be a VC in, in the billion dollar round. Like right now, it's pretty common to have in, in the States. And I think that the, the scale up of a, size of the business, uh, size of the of the structure that manage some funds. And, uh, and we'll see that that will be something that. Well, I'm looking forward to see how you guys keep going. And I'm, <laughs> I'm rooting for the uh, 41 high impact and the four potential unicorns to, to make it there. Um, really exciting to see the ecosystem really taking off. And you guys have been there since the very beginning. So it's, it's always interesting to, to hear your perspective. Thank you and congratulations for for you and your, your investment and and the way that you are trying to provide uh, content for educate uh, entrepreneurs and, and and investors and and everything is is very important. I I published two books about that and and I think that we need more people that are 
doing uh, producing content and to sharing this this content. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's it's key for the ecosystem, both to educate people outside of the ecosystem and then also to educate people in in Latam. So uh, I hope more people take it up as well. It's it's definitely something yeah. that we need as a as an ecosystem. Well, thanks again for doing it. I really appreciate it. We're definitely going to have to do a round two sometime in the future. Um, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with my guest, Ariel Arieta of NXTP, one of the most active investors in Latin America. If you like the podcast, please share it with a friend and give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Big thanks to Cody here, who wrote us our latest review, thanking us for the show notes, which are written by Angel, Sofia, and Josefina. Thanks, you three, for all of your help. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your day.